And thank you, Susan. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the welcome. Thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly. <laughs> well, I have some experience. That's true. That's true. So this is going to be a little bit of a weird talk. This is this is applied mathematics, but it's slightly different than the mathematics that usually gets applied. I, I said in the abstract that this has no prerequisites, that anybody can come and I will, I will make it as uh, clear and understandable as possible. And I will try to do so occasionally. I'm gonna go, but we'll, we'll pull it back. We'll keep it back. Let me <coughs> begin by talking a little bit about opinion dynamics. This is such an interesting area that I just got uh, interested in a, a couple of years ago. The idea is this, let's say that you have a social network, you have people that communicate based on some sort of friendship relationship. You can model that network as a graph. I'm going to do so as an undirected graph. So this is more like Facebook and less like Twitter. On Facebook, if I'm friends with you, you're friends with me. So there's not a directionality. Okay, so we have a bunch of nodes, people, a bunch of edges, communication links, or friendship. Assume that everybody online has an opinion on some topic. You could pick the topic. I don't know. Pick whatever it is. Pick, pick this tie. I wore a rather loud tie for this talk because online you're supposed to have like, you know, loud, bold colors. And maybe, maybe some of you do not like this tie. Maybe some of you do like this tie. Maybe some of you don't care. Why, why would you care about what the speaker is wearing, right? Okay, so let's model that, uh, that opinion as um, some real variable where favorability is positive, uh, don't like it is negative, zero means you don't care, and you have an intensity of opinion. So this is just modeled as a scalar variable. Okay, here's the problem. What happens to people's opinions over time, assuming that they communicate with one another over this social network, and there's some degree of influence as you communicate? Well, there's a bunch of different things that could happen. Everyone starts off with an opinion until they start talking, until they start discoursing. And then maybe what happens is a polarization where subgroups form with very intense opinions, maybe, maybe very different opinions. You some yes, some no, some who don't care. Maybe instead of polarization, you have consensus where everybody eventually comes to the same position, although maybe not so strong. Well, opinion dynamics is a huge area. There's been so much research in this. It's super interesting. Let me start off by going back to the beginning or a beginning. There are a lot of classical results. One that I find particularly motivating is by Taylor, 1968. And this uses the graph Laplacian of that network to predict how these opinions change over time. Let me take a second and recall what the graph Laplacian is. This is a beautiful and standard construct. If you've got a graph, you label the vertices. The graph Laplacian is a square matrix whose size is based on the number of vertices. It's got some really nice structure and properties. It's a way to encode the graph. You can express that graph Laplacian as the difference between a degree matrix, a diagonal matrix that encodes how many edges come into each vertex, and then the adjacency matrix, which vertex is connected to which other vertex. You can also express it more in terms of a boundary matrix, whatever, lots of ways to do this. This guy, super useful. Graph Laplacian all over the place in applied mathematics. Okay, back to the story, the history lesson, Taylor, 1968. The Laplacian, the graph Laplacian acts via diffusion. 
just like the Laplacian that you and I know and love from analysis. So if you set up a heat equation on x of t, where x is the vector of everybody's opinions, one slot per person, if you use this graph Laplacian in a set of ODEs, where you just set up the analog of a heat equation, you could do that in continuous time. You could do that in discrete time. This is like an Euler approximation to that differential equation. Then the result is that no matter what your initial condition is, no matter what everybody's opinions start out as, if you assume this sort of diffusive communication, this influence based on your neighbors, then you will eventually evolve to consensus, whereby consensus, I mean locally constant solutions. And that's the result. That's the theorem that kicks off this subject. And there's been a lot of work since then. But what do you think about that result? That result says that if we talk, we eventually come to agreement. It says that the more connections we have, the more and more we build social networks, the stronger the consensus we come to. I'm not so sure that that theorem is quite so descriptive of reality. And that motivates a lot of the work that has happened since. Most of the, the work that you'll see out there now focuses on much more complex settings and outcomes where instead of one opinion, you maybe have multiple opinions, in which case you can build analogs of the graph Laplacian. This is related to a lot of really cool stuff in applied math that Amit Singer has been doing in the past decade or so. You could talk about bounded confidence models, models where Yes, you, you diffuse, but only with people who are relatively close to you. People who are farther away, you, you, you reject, you push away from them. This is one way to get polarization. And there's a whole class of classical models called Hegelman Krauss, but many others. There's so much more that's happening in here. Things like modeling preference falsification, antagonistic interaction, otherwise known as trolls, and people who are more susceptible, et cetera, et cetera. Fascinating subject, tons and tons of papers, tons of really great work that draw on techniques from all over applied mathematics, not just graph theory, but ODEs, PDEs, game theory, all kinds of stuff. Most of the work that's out there tends to use graph theoretic methods because it's built over top of a social network. Now, many of the, the most current results are building and building and building on ever more complex models. When I got into this subject, my goals were to try to keep things as simple as possible and try to inject a couple of new techniques coming from the branch of mathematics that, that I've been working in, that being algebraic topology, and more specifically, sheaf theory. Sheaves and sheaf cohomology, scary terms, but not really if you cast it in the right way. Let me take a time out and talk a little bit about sheaves and sheaf cohomology. To anyone who's an expert in this subject, this is going to seem like a gross simplification because it is gross simplification. But nevertheless, even simple things can be very, very useful. When I think of a sheaf, I think of a data structure, an algebraic data structure that's sitting over top of and connected or tethered to some base space, something like a social network in this case. In the simplest applications, we're, we're just looking at a network and that data over the network can be really anything of an algebraic nature. The simplest thing that I could think of would be a vector space. You attach a vector space to vertices, to edges, 
and you tie it all together with linear transformations. Those are the kind of sheaves we're going to be working with today. So the idea is you've got some base space downstairs. That's the technical term. In most examples, we're going to look at the base space is a graph, vertices, edges. That's it. Sitting over top of this is the sheaf, the data. That data is going to take the form of vector spaces. In sheaf theory, these are called stocks. So over top of each vertex, we have a vector space. Over top of each edge, we have a vector space. They don't have to be the same dimension. They could be very, very different vector spaces. But we need to tie everything together. We need to stitch together all of these vector spaces. How do you go from one vector space to another space? Of course, use a linear transformation. So we're going to program the sheaf with a whole bunch of linear transformations from vertex data to edge data. That's the idea in more generality. If you have not a graph, but a simplicial complex, a cell complex, if that's familiar to you, then you can think of a cellular sheaf taking values in the category of vector spaces and linear transformations as just a functor. You associate data to all the cells and you associate <coughs> linear transformations to the connections between vertices and edges, edges to faces, higher dimensional things. These stocks are data. The maps are something like compatibility constraints, things that you can program to tie all of this data together. In a sheaf, these maps go from vertex data to edge data. You could turn things the other way around, in which case you have a co-sheaf. Instead of a covariant functor, you have a contravariant functor, if that language means anything to you. It's just data and mappings between data mediated by a graph or a simplicial complex. Now, the cool thing about things like simplicial complexes is they have a topology. They have a homology, an algebraic topological descriptor that keeps track of all the large scale features in that space. But the cool thing about sheaves, the cool thing about these data structures is they too have an algebraic topology. This is not called homology. For technical reasons, this is a cohomology theory. Sheaf cohomology in this simple setting of cellular sheaves is really, really nice. Very easy to define, unlike the more general case in algebraic geometry. What we do is we bundle together all of the vector spaces over all the vertices. It's just one big product vector space. Then we do the same thing over the edges. We take all the vector spaces all over all the edges. We just product them into one big vector space. If you have higher dimensional simplices, do the same thing there. You can build a sequence of linear transformations using something called a co-boundary operator. This is built from a product of all these different local operators that map vertex data to edge data and so on. There's a ton of data built into this sequence of algebraic vector spaces and linear transformations to compress that data out into the essential core. We use a common technique in, in homological algebra where we take the kernels of these maps, we mod out by the images of these maps. This gives you something called the cohomology of the sheaf. It is, again, a sequence of vector spaces that capture all the interesting features in this data structure. In particular, the simplest sheaf cohomology, the zero-dimensional sheaf cohomology, is capturing sequences of data over the vertices that are compatible over the edges. In sheaf theory, these are called the global sections. And they're like the, the set of solutions to the distributed system of linear constraints. 
this is something that's going to wind up being very useful to us. I know that it's a lot of uh, weird terminology, but it's really just a little bit of linear algebra mediated over a network or a more general simplicial complex. That's the simple class of sheaves that we're going to work with. Is this kind of stuff useful? Oh yeah, super useful. If you're in algebraic geometry or string theory or number theory or a number of different kinds of areas, but is it, is it really applied? Is it useful in that context? I would argue yes. And in fact, there are several historical incidents of people using these types of cellular sheaves and sheaf cohomology to solve problems. Some of these are intentional. Some of these are more accidental. There's so many examples of applied mathematicians sort of accidentally in reinventing homology or cohomology. In the past 10, 15 years, I've really been pushing this idea of using sheaves in applications. And there's been a whole bunch of really nice examples by lots of people. And increasingly, this is a technique for making sense of interesting data structures. What I wanna focus on today is one particular aspect of these sheaves that I think is very undervalued, that I think is incredibly, incredibly useful. And I'm gonna argue for some of that utility in the context of opinion dynamics. What I wanna really talk about today is Laplacians. We've already mentioned the graph Laplacian, yes, but I want to talk about the kinds of Laplacians that most applied mathematicians know and love, the ones with the derivatives in them. <clears throat> but being a topologist, I'm going to think in terms of topological things, geometric things, in particular, differential forms, and Laplacians associated with that. If we've got a, a nice manifold, let's say, I don't know, compact, finite dimensional, orientable, all the conditions that you might want, we can use the exterior derivative yeah, with a little bit of geometry, it's adjoint to define the Laplacian. And this is in the, the sort of Durham context. We can take that classical formulation, which if you're looking at zero form fields, scalar fields on your manifold, is just the usual Laplacian that we all know and love. But of course, there are higher order forms of this on higher degree differential forms. Now, the classical theorem from Hodge theory is that the kernels of these Laplacians compute the topology of your underlying manifold. They compute the cohomology in real coefficients. You're familiar with this, even if you're not familiar with this, from the basic theorems of vector calculus that we teach our undergrads. The point being, you can understand the topology of a smooth manifold via harmonic forms. Okay, that's the classical result that is really based on sheaves of differential forms over these manifolds. Now, let's move to this more discrete setting that we're working in, where we've got a sheaf of vector spaces over a graph or a higher dimensional simplicial complex. We can form these cochains where we bundle up the data over the vertices, of the edges, of the faces. We can look at the co-boundary operator. If our stocks, if our data is, let's say, based, if these vector spaces all have bases that we've specified or some other way of getting at the geometry of what's going on, uh, an inner product structure, then we can define the adjoint of these co-boundary operators. We can build a Laplacian in the same way. You, you go up, you go down, you go down, you go up, you add it all together. What happens is that we get a generalization of the classical graph Laplacian. And I mean that quite literally. If we have a constant sheaf 
of one dimensional vector spaces over all the cells with identity maps connecting them, then this Hodge Laplacian for the sheaf is really just the graph Laplacian. It's really just that simple matrix on zero cochains. On the other hand, the Hodge theorem still works. If you compute the kernel of this sheaf Laplacian, then what you get is the cohomology of the sheaf, of this data structure over top of it. That's a very powerful result. It allows you to do a lot of really interesting combinations of geometry and topology and analysis. You can say how close a collection of data is to being a consistent solution, a global section for this sheaf based on the geometry induced by this Laplacian. Okay, that's the, that's the heavy stuff. That's the, the difficult slide. If any of that didn't make sense, don't worry about it. We're gonna pull back to something that's a lot more explicit and easy to grasp because we're gonna go back to opinion dynamics and do some concrete examples. The following is joint work with a PhD student of mine, Jacob Hansen, who now works for a, an AI startup company in the Valley. We're gonna talk about examples of sheaves based on opinions and dynamics, based on discourse. Here's a new model for doing opinion dynamics. Let's say that you've got a social network, a graph. What I'm gonna do is put vector spaces over the vertices and the edges. But this is not a scalar variable. It's not whether or not you like my tie. We can be much more general. So over the vertices, we have vector spaces. And these vector spaces are opinions that an individual has, basis opinions. There's some collection of core things that each person cares about. And they have a scalar variable, a scalar preference on that. Now, the thing is, it's not the same vector space from person to person. The things that I really care about are probably almost certainly different than the things that you really care about. But we've each got some vector space with a dedicated basis. All right, great. What are the edges? The edges are discourse spaces. If you and I are talking, if we're discussing some ideas and trying to figure out what's, what's our opinion on these things, if we're doing politics at a departmental level or maybe higher or lower, then we've got some sort of vector space, some collection of opinions, some topics that we're expressing our opinions on. These Vector spaces might have nothing to do with your core beliefs, with my core beliefs. They're totally different vector spaces. But the cool thing is a sheaf can handle that. Now, the last ingredient we need are the linear transformations that go from the data over the vertices, my opinions, your opinions, to the data over the edges, what we're talking about. That is a formulation, an expression of an opinion based on core beliefs. And in this model, these are linear transformations. If I double the intensity of my beliefs, I'm going to double the intensity of my expressed opinion over what we're talking about. Okay, uh, simple example, kind of dumb example, but let's say that the thing we're talking about is a one-dimensional vector space. Uh, shall we go get some food? And your opinions, your core beliefs might have something to do with whether you like walking and whether you're hungry or not. And let's say that you're kind of hungry, but you really don't feel like walking. So the expression of your opinion on let's walk to town and get some food might be vaguely, mildly positive. 
Whereas for me, I'm thinking about tacos. I'm thinking about some cerveza and I have some pretty strong opinions on both of these. So I'm like, yes, let's go. Let's get some food. Okay. That's how this model works. But then you have to think about it over this gigantic social network, lots and lots of different connections. The things that you and I are talking about are different than the things that you and the other person are talking about. Because we can program these sheaves to have any kind of linear transformations we want, we're not necessarily sharing our core beliefs. By putting in some negative signs into these linear transformations, you can model people who lie, if you want, about their opinion. You can do so selectively. I express one opinion to you, but I express a very different opinion when I'm talking with this person. This is a very interesting and flexible model that is made possible by what the sheaf can do. And in fact, if you look at all the technical stuff that goes into sheaves, they have very, very concrete interpretations. Zero co-chains, distributions of data over vertices, are private opinion distributions. One co-chains, that is distributions over the edges, are pairwise discussions, things that are public. The co-boundary operator is measuring the amount of aggregate public disagreement. The Laplacian has to do with considering the opinions of the people that you're talking to, all your neighbors, and trying to sort of average them out. And then the zero dimensional cohomology, the global sections of your sheaf are literally harmonic distributions of opinions. Distributions of opinions that when expressed lead to harmony, lead to consensus. Okay, so that's the model. That's the idea. What can we do with it? One of the things that's really cool about this is that it's very easy to prove some really cool sounding theorems. Here's the main one that gets things started. And this is an echo of Taylor's theorem from 1968. We're going to set up a heat equation on these discourse sheaves. Maybe I do it in continuous time using the sheaf Laplacian, where x of t is a distribution of opinions over each of the vertices. So everyone's private beliefs. If they're modified based on talking to your neighbors, then in continuous time, in discrete time, doesn't matter, start off with any initial condition, any distribution of private opinions, you will exponentially converge to the closest harmonic distribution to a global section. And when I say closest, I mean by orthogonal projection, we've got geometry on all these things. This is very much an analog of Taylor's theorem, but adapted to this much more general model. Okay, so what does this mean? Does this mean that everybody agrees? We talk and we all come to agreement? No, this does not mean that everybody agrees because everybody's got their private opinion and they're expressing it through some formulation. What this means is that we have an expressed consensus. We talk and everyone comes to an agreement while still holding their private opinions, though perhaps slightly modified. This transference of agreement from personal beliefs to expressed beliefs is one of the very cool things about this model. Okay, but that's just the beginning. And it's actually not a hard theorem to prove. It all has to do with the semi-definite, uh, positive semi-definite uh, nature of the Laplacian in this case. When you've got this Laplacian, this notion of what it means to be harmonic, there's so much intuition that you can generate from that. For example, let's say that you've got some people in your social network who are stubborn, who will not move. They just blare their opinion out and they will not yield. 
I'm sure you've never run into anybody like that on the internet, but let us be mathematicians and hypothesize that such a person could exist. Then how do we account for that in this model? Well, it's pretty simple. You would just zero out the dynamics, the diffusion on them. You would have in a more general setting, maybe a variable diffusion coefficients. But in this extreme example, let's say that we modify the heat equations so that it's the Laplacian uh, for most people, but for some people in this subset U of agents, zero dynamics. They don't change at all. They're stubborn. Then what happens in this case, every initial condition is going to converge over time to the closest what? The closest harmonic extension of the initial condition over these stubborn agents. This is what is so cool about having a Laplacian. You, you inherit this language of harmonic, of harmonic extension, and it really works. Now, what can you say about these harmonic extensions? Existence, uniqueness? We can prove that such an extension always exists. It's unique if a certain relative cohomology group vanishes. And to speak to the more topological side of, of experts for a second, um, this is what cohomology is good for, is classifying solutions to problems. And in this case, it's a relative cohomology class that determines uniqueness. Okay, well, what else could you do? You know, thinking about stubborn agents who are just driving the system with their opinions, they're kind of like propagandists. What could you do as far as modeling propaganda within a system? What if you plant some opinions? Can you drive the system to a desired conclusion? Well, again, uh, this is classical control theory. If we just update it to this language of sheaves and discourse sheaves, we can get some really uh, fascinating, albeit somewhat scary, results. If we drive a system to a harmonic distribution using some collection of agents, you, that are the propagandists, they're stubborn, they just blast their opinions and are immovable. And we identify a certain other subset of people whose opinions we want to drive. We want to observe them and see how we can influence them over time. What is possible? What classifies? What can happen is these zero-dimensional relative cohomology classes. The relative cohomology in grading zero with respect to you is the obstruction to controllability of the system. If instead of modding out by U, you mod out by Y, the observables, you get the obstruction to observability, to being able to detect any opinion distribution you want on this subset, given the appropriate driving, given the appropriate initial condition. If both of these relative cohomology groups vanish, then your propagandists can drive that subset of observables to have any opinions they want. That sounds scarier than it really is because in order to compute these things, you have to know a lot of private information in the system. I don't think it's possible, but it's an interesting application of these ideas to this model. Okay. There's one other uh, sort of technical point that I want to uh, highlight because I think this starts getting at issues of how realistic is this model. This model, like all very uh, mathematically sophisticated models is, is a bit cartoonish, but there's one aspect which I think is, it, it gets us closer to reality and it is very interesting. And this is getting at the notion of what is actually happening when you're sharing your opinions with other people. Do you really change your opinion 
over time. I suppose it's possible, but the way that we've set this model up, I, I think it's kind of unrealistic. If you go back to the simple example, and if we assume diffusion, if we assume that an initial um, gap in our expressed opinions will close over time, the way that we set up the dynamics is on the zero dimensional co-chains. That means you and I are changing our core opinions, our personal beliefs, and fixing the mode of expression so that we come to consensus. Is it really the case that when we discuss, you're getting more hungry? Is it really the case that when we discuss, I like tacos less than I did before? That seems kind of unrealistic. Maybe possible to a degree. But I think it would be much better if instead of putting dynamics on the, on the personal beliefs, what we put dynamics on is on the linear transformations, the expressions of those personal beliefs. Let's change the types of dynamics that we do instead of evolving the personal opinions, we evolve the expressions, these maps from vertex data to edge data. I can write down a complicated looking set of differential equations on these linear transformations. And one can prove that if you evolve the expression maps, then no matter what your initial condition, you will converge to the closest discourse sheaf for which your initial opinion distribution is a global section. That means everyone fixes their initial beliefs, but we modify how we express those beliefs based on communication, based on trying to come to consensus. And in the end, what happens is we come to an expressed consensus. We don't actually agree. We haven't actually changed our mind on anything. We just now learn to communicate better, as one could say. So in the extreme example that you're perhaps all thinking of, in the case where you're talking about a, a politician, some politician could be any politician, university president, dean, president, president, whatever, um, if we have people who start off with wildly different opinions, then changing the expression maps can lead to a system where everybody is saying things that leads to pairwise agreement, even though everyone's opinions are held. And what I say to this person might be very different than what I say to that person. But in the end, you know, we all get along because that's the way we got to do things in order to get the job done. Okay. Now, again, there's a lot more. And if you'd like to see some of the, the technical stuff, some of the proofs, there's a, there's a paper on this that's in the Siam Journal of Applied Math. This work really began just as a simple cartoon model because I was trying to explain why I like cellular sheaves so much to the fine folks who fund me. And I figured that this would be a good way to do it, but it actually wound up leading to a bunch of really cool math and, and maybe some really cool applications on its own. In the remaining 10 minutes of this talk, what I'd like to do is talk about where this stuff goes. Opinion dynamics, huge field, tons of work, lots of interesting models out there. Can't touch on all that. What I want to do is really push the mathematics on this to, to go beyond the simple setting that I've talked about. So far, these sheaves that I've talked about, they're really simple. They're valued in vector spaces. The sheaf cohomology is kind of, it's, it's just really basic. To, uh, to a mathematician who does sheaf theory, nothing I've done here is anything other than just the basics. But I think, that there's a lot more that you could do. 
if you move beyond vector space as your data, what I want to talk about is some joint work with my current PhD student, Hans Ries, who is in electrical and systems engineering at UPenn. Our engineers at Penn are mathematically very sophisticated. And what we are working on is not sheaves of vector spaces, but sheaves of lattices, algebraic lattices. What do I mean by that? I mean a, uh, a post set, a partially ordered set that has a particular pair of operations, the join and the meet. These are generalizations of union or least upper bound and intersection or greatest lower bound respectively. This is a classical subject in algebra that touches on so many things. If we have lattices, we could talk about lattice transformations, ways of going from one lattice to another. These come in adjoint pairs that are called Galois connections, if you're more of an algebraist. And if you are more uh, sort of computationally minded, there's some very, very explicit conditions you could write down, but this connects to some very nice mathematics. So what I'm envisioning is a sheaf of these lattices. Instead of individuals having basis opinions and then a scalar valued preference relation, I'm interested in more complex types of opinions where you can have, well, I think this is better than this. And I think this is better than this, but I'm not sure about these two things, but this is definitely better than both of these. And this is definitely worse than everything. That kind of structure can be modeled algebraically very nicely by an algebraic lattice. But everyone might have very different calculi for what they think about lots of different things. I think this is good motivation for looking at these sheaves of lattices. What's the problem? The problem is the category of lattices and these lattice morphisms, these Galois connections, it's, and I'm sorry to get a little technical here, it's not an abelian category. I can't do uh, sheaf cohomology. I can't do a Hodge Laplacian. I can't do Hodge theory. I can't do any of these things that make all the stuff that I've talked about so far work. So what are we gonna do? Again, the one idea from this talk that I would love for you to take away is that Laplacians are almost magical. They're everywhere. They, they take on so many different forms and they allow you to do so much stuff. And so our strategy for these sheaves of lattices is to define a Laplacian. And we call this the Tarski Laplacian, based on the work of Tarski on lattices. Here's the definition. You have a sheaf of lattices on a graph. You have a distribution of lattice points over all the vertices. That's your zero cochain. The Laplacian on that vector of lattice points on the zero cochain is written down in terms of these uh, lattice morphisms and their adjoints, all of these Galois connections. This looks complicated. It is complicated. It's a whole bunch of different meets arranged according to the structure of the graph. Why is this a Laplacian? The lemma that you can prove is that you can split this operator into two parts. One part that looks kind of like a, a degree matrix where you're expanding out to your neighbors. And another part that looks like subtracting off the adjacency matrix where you're pulling back information from your neighbors and intersecting with that. That's the best I can do as far as intuition with all these uh, uh, intimidating looking symbols here. But this really is a Laplacian in this setting. Why is it a Laplacian? It's a Laplacian because we can prove theorems, the kinds of theorems that would work if this were a Laplacian. We can set up something like a Hodge theory. 
And this is a far reaching generalization of the classical Tarski fixed point theorem for complete lattices. If we have a sheaf of complete lattices on a graph, then the zero dimensional cohomology, the global sections of this sheaf do exist, they make sense, and they can be computed by taking this Tarski Laplacian and iterating it over and over and over again until you converge to a set of fixed points. We prove that this iteration always leads to convergence. And this set of fixed points is identically the set of global sections for this sheaf. This is a discrete time heat equation on this system of lattices and lattice homomorphisms. And this is very cool stuff that points to some really deep mathematics. I think this is going to allow us to do some very sophisticated types of opinion dynamics, the types of very sort of rich uh, complicated partial order structures that none of the existing models out there can handle. And I also think it's going to point to some really cool mathematics. Again, Hodge theory does not work in this context. You can't define higher dimensional cohomology for these sheaves, but we can define higher dimensional Laplacians. And we can take their kernels, that is, we can look at fixed points of the Laplacian wedge, the identity, the things that you get by evolving according to a discrete time heat equation, let's just call that the cohomology of these sheaves, even though the classical sheaf cohomology doesn't exist. We can prove some really cool theorems about that and start doing some things that connect to some deeper areas of mathematics. I think this is a decent example of how a very applied problem and something that we were motivated to solve based on the applications, it turns around and then leads to some new mathematics, some potentially interesting stuff. And that's the way the interplay between pure and applied mathematics should always go. Now, uh, we're not done there. There's some other things that we're working on with regards to stuff that I would probably rather not explain in detail since it involves sheaves that take values in more general categories than the category of lattices. Um, certain uh, weighted monoidal categories is kind of complicated stuff. But, but in the end, what we're gonna be able to do is model very, very rich sorts of internal opinion spaces, external discourse spaces, and build something like harmonic opinion distributions. Importing this language of Laplacians from applied mathematics is really the key to understanding what's going on, even in these very, very rarefied and, and somewhat esoteric settings. With that, I would like to acknowledge the fact that everything I've talked about today is in co collaboration with people in my group. Uh, the things you've heard about today are collaborations with Jacob Hansen and Hans Ries, but there are others in my group as well with whom we are working on other stuff. I'd also like to thank the U.S. Department of Defense who has been funding this, and I would like to thank you for listening to what is kind of a weird applied math talk. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.